thank you all very much for the invitation to come along and talk to you today. Um, my sort of uh, direction is to talk about being authentic at work. And um, just before I maybe talk about that, because I guess I've been invited to talk about that subject because I've had lots of different jobs. Um, I started off life as a paper boy at the age of 11, when children are allowed to go to work at a young age. Um, then I sort of got promoted and stacked shelves in a grocery store. And then money-wise, things improved. Uh, but in terms of career progression, probably not so much. I became a toilet cleaner in a bakery in Barton's. The money was fantastic, and I didn't earn as much disposable income until I was about 25. And then I've done a whole series of things. But the one thing I've never done is to be an undertaker. Now, the reason I mention that is because you can't hear me. I apologise. Okay? I shall speak up. Okay? I was told not to speak too loudly, so can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Um, the one thing I'm not is an undertaker. Now, the reason I mention that is um, every morning I try and go and buy the Daily Mail for Lady Hardy. And one particular Tuesday, I went along to buy it from the um, community shop. And I love dogs. And I got chatting to um, a little long-haired dachshund outside and went in, and the lady who owned the dachshund with her friend was in the shop. And so I said, oh, what a lovely dachshund. That's a lovely dog. And she said, oh, he doesn't normally talk to men. So I said, well, I feel privileged. <laughs> and then she said, I recognise you. And I said, do you? And she said, how long do you live in the village? And I said, yes. How long have you lived in the village? And I said, well, about 14 years. And she said, I know who you are. You're the local undertaker. <laughs> so I've been sort of mistaken for many things in my life, but never an undertaker. So I said, um, uh, I don't think I am. And she said, no, I know. <laughs> you are the local undertaker. And I said, trust me, I would know if I was an undertaker. I'm not the local undertaker. And she said, well, where do you live then? And I said, well, I live on Langley Road. She said, what's your name? So I said, it's Russell, Russell Hardy. And uh, she said, well, what do you do? And I said, I do a whole series of different things. And she said, I'm going to go and Google you. Now, <laughs> bless her cotton socks, without, she was, she was a, a retired lady. So she boldly went off and said, I'm going to Google you. And with a friend, we'll Google him together. <laughs> Fast forward, forward two weeks, I'm in the shop again. And the lady's there, and I'm think, just going, and buy my Daily Mail again. Apparently, the female section on a Tuesday, you've got to get the Daily Mail on a Tuesday. And um, so she said, I did Google you. And she said, all these things came up of what you do. And I looked at LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is the thing which business people, it's like a Facebook for business people, and it has your CV. And she said, you do this and this and this. And I said, uh, are you sure you've got the right man? And she said, no, it's definitely you. And I said, no, no, you've got the wrong man. I'm the local undertaker. <laughs> but um, the relevance of that story is um, that I do do a lot of different things. I think at the last count, I've got about seven different jobs. And I mainly deal in healthcare and charity now. But on the subject of being authentic at work, I want to start off, and we'll be singing it later, but just because it puts things into context. Quote from me, uh, quote, the most wonderful poem I know in the whole world, which is Isaac Watts, as I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forgive it, Lord, that I should boast save in the cross of Christ my Lord. I'd just like you to hold that in your minds. So, being authentic. I grew up in Essex. I'm an Essex boy. I come from Basildon. Um, if ever you're going down Essex and you come across a sign for Basildon, I suggest you drive straight past and go and visit somewhere nice like Southend or Shrewby Ness. 
Basildon is not the best place to um, be, but people from Basildon, excluding myself, are generally a good sort. But when we were growing up and we were teenagers, this whole issue of being authentic was quite a thing when we started to take a girl out on a date. And we developed a way of talking about one another, which was to talk about how much, what percentage of ourselves we were being. And so you, on your early date, you try and impress your girlfriend, and your friends would see you. And if they saw you out at a cinema or somewhere, they'd say, 30%, okay, 40%, which means you weren't being entirely natural. You weren't being genuine. You weren't being yourself. And that sort of resonated with my friends for years. And in business situations, you can see people being a percentage of themselves. Okay. And I remember when... Um, again, I was a bit older, having to go round to other people's houses, you know, particularly people who were from a better background for me, and things like which way you pass the port. That was a big issue for me. I didn't know which way you pass the port. I still get confused. And therefore, I'd be thinking in my own mind, hold on, I'm only down at about 35% at the moment. Being authentic in life is much, much easier than it sounds. The word authentic comes from the Greek, authentikos, and it means being genuine, being truthful, being what you truly are. Now, for lots of us in life, we're so busy with stuff, we often don't have time to really think about who we are and what we stand for and really understanding ourselves. And so quite often we end up in a situation where we almost role-play in different situations. When I was growing up, there was a character called Wurzel Gummidge on the TV. And Wurzel Gummidge, bless his cotton socks, was a lovely chap. But he used to put different heads on. Okay? I've got to put my worker's head on. Okay? I've got to put my gardener's head on. And he'd be putting different heads on. He was a scarecrow, for those of us who don't know the program. But he'd put different heads on, different personalities. Now, we do that an awful lot of the time. And we try to, in my view, have shadows in our lives. And that verse from Psalm 36 talks about God's light shining down on us and providing light. We can be and pretend to be different things to different people. We can pretend to be different things occasionally to ourselves. We can pretend to be more righteous than we really are. But the reality is, with God, God knows us in our purest form. There is no single aspect of our life, no matter how embarrassing it is, that God doesn't know about you as an individual. And you start off feeling a bit awkward about that. But for me, that's immensely liberating. To know that we've got a God in heaven, our Father, who understands us in our purest way. You know, as a parent, and Julia, bless her cotton socks, has more experience than almost anyone else in the room at the moment. But as a parent, you forgive your children so much. I mean, there are times when um, our son, who isn't here this morning, because I can talk about him, drives my wife and I to absolute despair. Okay? But you forgive them in a way that isn't rational. It isn't rational to put up with the behaviour that kids put you through. That's what love is. But in heaven, apart from Morse code going on, in heaven, we've got our Father. And our Father forgives us. But there's one requirement. And that one requirement is that we believe in his Son as our Saviour. You know, to get the forgiveness of God is not difficult. 
You don't need to go to university. You don't need to have gone to the right school. You don't need to have had the right background. You simply need to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our wrongdoings, that he rose three days later and is in heaven now. If you believe that, you're in. Job done. It's not complicated. There's no such thing as purgatory. There's none of that other complicated stuff. There's a purity of grace given to us in the form of Jesus. That's our God, our Father, and he understands all of us perfectly well. But we do get embarrassed about stuff, and we particularly get embarrassed about being a Christian quite often. One of the real joys, we, um, a group of us have a Thursday night. It was called the Young Men's Bible Study at some point. But now a number of us are in our 50s. It seems a bit of a, an oddity calling it that. But every Thursday night, anyone's welcome. Uh, we have a prayer meeting around at my house. Um, it's not the undertakers. We have a prayer meeting at our house. Um, and then every couple of weeks we do a bit of Bible study. And every fourth week we have a curry down at the Tandoori in Arden. But over the last year, we've had three great new individuals join that group, one of whom is Alistair, one of whom is Russell, and the third of which is John. Now, John and I share an affliction, and that affliction is we're both Manchester United supporters. And John very kindly um, lent my son and I his season tickets, so we went along to Old Trafford about a month ago. And the great thing arriving at Old Trafford, and it's replicated around the country at football matches, was that um, people put their scarves on, Manchester United, and I think it was Liverpool that day we were playing. Everyone put their scarves on, puts their hats on, and they're really proud to be associated with that team. There's no embarrassment, even if your team's losing all the time. You put on your scarf and your hat. Now, as Christians, challenge number one, how embarrassed are we to proclaim our faith? You know, if we're being bold, we might be quite proud of ourselves putting a little fish on the back of the car, okay? or a sticker on the back of the car. Okay? But quite often in social situations, we hold back from talking about our love for God and what Jesus has done for us. And one of the things I've learned is the more you're willing to talk about the Lord in social situations, you'll be amazed at the conversations that open up. And one of the great things about John in particular is John gives an outstanding witness at work, which he often shares with us on our Thursday nights, and is a real example of a truly authentic Christian. And I take my hat off to you, John. So being authentic, you know, it's not easy. We do need to challenge ourselves. But we shouldn't escape the reality that God knows all about us, all about those things you try and hide from your partner or hide from people at work. God knows us entirely and still loves us. Now, on the subject of work, you know, I think Phil touched on it. You know, we talk about work, and I think the original idea of today was to talk about careers, and I'll come back to that. But all of us have a job of work to do. You know, whether that's, and I, again, bow low before Julia, looking after the children. You know, any time I've looked after children, I want to, like Wurzel Gummidge, pull my own head off and run away. It's not easy. The idea of staying at home with kids permanently. Any mother who does that has my utmost respect. That's really hard work. Going to the office and having a chat over a cup of coffee about strategy and all the different things you need to do at work pales into ease compared to being a mum at home. Okay? We all do different work. But for God, he's not interested in careers and that type of stuff. Because as Phil indicated, God's great command to us, the Lord's great command to us, to the disciples, was, go ye forth into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them 
of my commands. That's, what, that's the last thing the Lord told the disciples before he went to heaven. And there's a lovely bit in Ephesians where Paul says, and this for me is a really nice sort of way of thinking about the work that God wants us to do. He said, be kind and tender-hearted. Be kind and tender-hearted. They're the things that are important to God, not our careers. But particularly for men, and I think it is an affliction of, often of men, careers can be like a seduction. You go to work and you think you're important because you, you've got this job, and then you get a pay rise and you feel even more important and a different job title, and then you get a company car. Okay? Company cars are great. Okay? I'm really important. Then you get a bigger company car. Okay? My company car is better than his company car in the car park. That makes me even more important. And it becomes seductive. And then you're told about this really important project that they want you to do at work. And you're the only person who can do it. So you go off and you work even more hours. And then you find that your relationships at home are going upside down. You find your relationship with your children is going upside down. But more importantly, you find your relationship with the Lord is going upside down. The stuff you do at work to progress your career, trust me, I've been very blessed with a career, um, is unimportant to God. Because he didn't say to me when he saved me and died on the cross, Russ, I really want you to be a chairman of this company. It's totally unimportant. Being authentic as a Christian is what is important to God. And the way I try and get round the challenge of work and be a, a Christian is quite often to try and introduce Bible stories into my work. And we were talking about this the other week, at one of the Thursday nights. So if, I'm, if we're talking about a point on strategy, I'll introduce a bit of the Old Testament. So, for example, if we're... Um, talking about a, a new project and everyone's hesitating. I'll say, well, we need to be like Joshua. And so everyone around the ball table looks at me and thinks, what's he talking about? Who's Joshua? So I'll say, well, Joshua was, of course, the person who took over from Moses after uh, Moses died and was leading the people. He led the people into the promised land. But before they went into the promised land, Joshua was really uncertain whether to do it. And God had to tell him three times to be strong and courageous. And that's what we need to be on this project. We need to be like Joshua. Okay. So people wonder what tangent I've gone off and then realise. And that's got a bit embarrassing on occasion because I do that. I'm, I'm chairman of a hospital and the hospitals now have to have their board meetings in public. And so at my board meeting, I hope no one's here from the press, um, but I do know this is going on the YouTube, um, I have a journalist from the Shropshire Star come to every board meeting I give. And he hears me give these little diktats. Okay? Like, well, we don't want to be like the Jews wandering around the desert for 40 years on a journey that should have taken 40 days. And I say, oh. And you can see the man from the Shropshire Star looking around from the end thinking, what's he going to talk about now? But I've found that by being a bit bold and not being afraid to look a bit of an idiot on occasion to God, those stories resonate with people. It's like being passionate. King David was passionate. And we often hold ourselves back because of feeling embarrassed at work about talking about the wonderful grace that's been given to us. We need to be more like Manchester United fans, putting on our scarves, putting on our hats, and being willing to boldly speak about our Lord and Saviour. Okay. Now, one of the other things I notice about work is people are really good at doing to-do lists. And again, we talked about this recently. Everyone's very organised at work. 
They'll write a to-do list. In fact, I'm always impressed when I go around to people's houses and they've got a to-do list on their fridge or somewhere about things we need to do. The actions of the day, organising the families, getting the logistics sorted out. And I think that's always... I'm not very good at to-do lists. But how many of us do a, a daily to-do list for the Lord? How many of us actually just write one thing down in the morning that we're going to do for the Lord? I bet you when you go to work, those of us who go to work, will write down a whole bundle of things that we need to do that day. Challenge number two. How many of us write a to-do list every day for the Lord? Okay. If we did that, everyone in this room, the impact would be enormous. And the third thing I learned from work is it's always important. And when I was a young man, I thought I knew it all. Young men often do. And so I'd always be a bit awkward about going to my boss and saying, actually, I'm not sure what to do here. Can you help? And I had a wonderful boss when I worked at Unilever called Les Pickles. He's probably dead now. He probably never expected to be on an audio tape on a sermon in Claverton. But Les Pickles was a wise old soul, and he was really good at helping young men lose their ego a bit and come and ask for help. And he did it in a very nice, gentle way. And Les Pickles taught me how to write really good reports. But he also taught me not to be afraid to go and ask the boss for help. Now, in our daily lives, okay, we've got the best boss of all. We've got God our Father. And we can ask him at any point in our day for help. I'm not sure what to do. What should I do? I'm not sure how to handle this situation. What should I do? I don't think I'm being tender-hearted enough. What should I do? Prayer is a wonderful gift given to us. You know, I was talking to a friend, um, and I'm not sure whether he's a believer or not. I know he prays occasionally. And he was saying that when he was ill, he'd prayed a lot to God, and it had really helped him. Prayer is the most wonderful gift of communication and access that God has given us. But often we forget to pray. If we do pray, we'll pray in the morning, maybe pray at night. But during the day, we forget to pray. And God's there, willing to listen and help. So my third piece of advice would be, let's all pray a bit more. Pray about the small stuff and the big stuff. Because God helps with it all. He's our Father. So in terms of being authentic at work, I think it's really important just to not be embarrassed. To be proud, and the only thing we should be proud of is about being a Christian and what God's done for us. Forgive me, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ my God. I hope it's been interesting. Just a final reminder, I'm not an undertaker. If ever you do need an undertaker, apparently there's a very good one down in Henley and Arden. And even Phil said to me when we were talking about today, actually, Russell... If I saw you in a hat, an undertaker's hat, I can see the similarity. So you won't be seeing me in a hat like that. The Lord bless you. Thank you very much.